All right, welcome everybody to the January 19th Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. As you are all aware, two things that we must abide by on this call. The first is the antitrust policy uh, that is currently displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct. Uh, so for announcements today, we have the standard announcement of the Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter that goes out each Friday. If there's something that you would like to go into that newsletter, please leave a comment on the link that is in the agenda. Um, any other announcements that anybody has? All right, we'll take that as a no. Uh, we did get two quarterly reports in this past week. Uh, I think the majority of us have had a chance to review both the fabric and the cacti reports. Um, I didn't see any specific things coming in the comments that we needed to talk to uh, or about on this call, but is there anything that anybody would like to bring up? I think David in your had left a comment in the original version of the fabric report that his links to LFX had broken. Um, and I apologize, that's a fluid system. I think the most durable way to do that would probably be to export it as a PDF and attach it to your page, but I don't know. Okay. I think it's okay, I got it working. I found a way to do a uh, date range that I think is persistent. I'm gonna go check the other records, but we I put a date range in and then I just, just adjust the dates for each report and it gets to a, a static report, like a, a, re a repeatable report. All right. Uh, we still are waiting on the URSA uh, report to come in. So we will, um, again, give some time for that to settle down uh, and for the community to come back together on that. Rama, I did see you come off mute. Is there something you want to add? Uh, no, I just wondered uh, why I'm not able to uh, chat. Uh, when I click on the chat option, it gives me chat disabled. So is there something yep. special I have to do? No, chat and Zoom oh. is disabled. Um, okay. The chat, the chat for this occurs in Discord. Oh, okay, sure. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, we have a a thread for each of the meetings that I create uh, that I put the agenda in. Feel free to add any chat comments there as well. All righty. Uh, so the next report that we have due is the Sawtooth one. Uh, it's in two weeks that comes due. Arun, question? Right. Um, rather question or like a um, uh, comment to the fabric maintainers. I see the, the report. Um, there are a lot many things that is going on. And thanks for capturing all those details. And one aspect that particularly interested is on the admin SDK. Now, um, continuing on the same lines, I know uh, some of the Fabric co-maintainers are also involved in a lab project called Fabric Operator. There is a separate discussion going on with HLF Operator proposal merging with other projects and then um, getting that, uh, getting those maintainers working on different operator projects in, under one umbrella. So um, I know there was one call previously, which was which did not have fabric maintainers on that, but David um, had replied that he was available for email charts. Um, so we we should probably um, like we'll include you, David, in that thread again, and look for your comments in that. Uh, that would be good. Yeah, uh, we do have some folks that are. Um, dedicated to fabric operator. Unfortunately, they've been pretty heads down on some internal deliverables, and so they haven't been able to engage much uh, on these things, but I hope that's changing. Uh, I think they're freeing up in a couple of weeks here. 
Uh, I myself don't have too much Kubernetes experience, so I don't know if I'll add too much value, but I'm trying to get those folks, um, it's, it's actually another team, but I'm trying to get them freed up so that they can help out with the operator discussions. Thanks. Any other comments on the quarterly reports? No. Okay. Uh, so, Arno, are you uh, willing to give us today an open source security foundation overview? Uh, yes. Or shall we move okay. on to the discussion? Okay, great. So, am I allowed to share? Actually, yes, it looks like it. Working. Can you guys see my screen? My slides? That's good. I'd work from the first go. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I understand the goal of the exercise. So, I, you know, I quickly pulled together a bunch of slides. I mean, essentially, I'm going to try to give you a quick overview of what this organization is about and uh, try to quickly, uh, you know, give you pointers as to some of the products of the organization are, that are relevant to Hyperledger specifically. So, and, and give you a bit more details on that. So with that further ado, what is this organization about to start with? So, um, I mean, generally speaking, right, OpenSSF is trying to tackle the, an issue related to the security of uh, the software supply chain. It's really open source software supply chain, but given that uh, open source is used everywhere, uh, I actually think it's really the software supply chain in general. Uh, the, the organization went through two significant phases. It was initially started in 2020. Uh, at the time we were still in COVID, uh, members were not so keen on committing a lot of money to yet another organization. <laughs> And so the organization was launched with very little resources put into it. And it kind of grew organically for a year without much supervision or you know, resources. And uh, it was relaunched in 2021 with the proper funding, you know, similar to what we have in all LF initiatives. Um, it is a, a, a sister project to Hyperledger, if you will. So it's under the uh, Linux Foundation umbrella. And so since uh, October 2021, uh, this is a project that is now fully funded. It has attracted many members. There's a similar system of uh, multi-tier levels uh, for the members. Um, so why OpenSSF, right? I mean, um, as I was saying, open source is used everywhere more and more. And uh, at the same time, it seems like bad actors have realized that uh, while the industry has got much better at, uh, you know, uh, securing systems that are in production, we the, the soft spot is be, uh, has become uh, open source software. Um, essentially, we have we're seeing an explosion in attacks of the open source software itself, and there are many different uh, uh, points of attacks. I will get a touch on that next, but um, so. It is to the point that you know um, the uh, this is attracting government's attentions. You know, under typically the the more broader term uh, cybersecurity, you see governments looking into this and saying, "Come on, industry, you need to get your act together." Uh, this is costing millions of dollars and, and whatever currency you know you happen to be in. Um, the uh, we, I mean, you know, it's pretty famous. If, unless you live under a rock, you probably heard of Log4j that happened uh, during the holidays uh, last year, and that took you know a, the whole industry by surprise and created a, a big man. And this kind of active, you know, uh, uh, this kind of uh, occurrences just keep increasing over and over. So governments. Uh, especially you know in the US 
uh, last year there was uh, well it's two years ago now um, I need to adjust the out 2023 um, you know the there was a the issue an executive order that basically told the industry you need to start working on this problem for real and they actually w were pretty specific about you know uh, trying to address one of the very your problem we have related to this, which is the fact that in practice, nobody even knows what's running in the in the products. And, um, you know, we all as developers know what it's like to use, you know, any pro modern programming languages, whether it's no Java or whatever, go, we have this system of packages where you do imports and you can add a lot of uh, uh, functionality very easily. Unfortunately, you have typically no clue where it's coming from, how many layers of dependencies you're pulling in. And I mean, NPM install is very good at showing you how scary this can be. And so the uh, the executive order specifically required the industry to start producing what's called SBOM, software bill of material, that will basically list uh, all the different components that can be found in a in a software product, and um, this would at least address one of the problems that the whole industry has faced during the log4j, for instance, which is, gee, do we even use this software? Do we? Where do we use it? Right. So, of course, you know, governments are telling us. And by the way, I should have pointed out uh, it's similar. Uh, you know, activities are going on. In the EU, they are going even further. There is under development an act called Cyber Resilience Act, which goes even further in, you know, putting liability on the developers and even going as far as planning for penalties for not providing, you know, uh, the, the right uh, verification and, you know, the, uh, information about the software we're producing. So it's still very much in, in debate, but uh, these are the kind of things that are happening. So of course, it is better for the industry to start getting its act together. And essentially, this is what OpenSSF is trying to do, is help the industry move forward on addressing this big problem. Uh, OpenSSF alone is not gonna solve the problem. Uh, this is a major, major problem that's, you know, much broader than any single organization can tackle. And there are efforts in other organizations as well going on. But so this slide actually shows some of the, the attack points that we uh, can identify in the uh, production of software, right? It goes from the developer to the left all the way to the consumer. I'm not going to get into the details of all these different points of attacks, but I think it's interesting to realize it's not it's not even like there's one particular spot where you can just say, oh, if we bought this. And and in fact, if you look at the you know uh, security uh, breaches that have happened uh, over the last uh, few years, they actually touch every single point. All of these points of attacks have actually been used. So this is not just theoretical. So for the sake of uh, keeping it short, I will just quickly skip to the next slide, which is gives you a general overview of uh, the, the OpenSSF structure. Uh, so it's not, unfam you know, it's very different from what you'd find in, the, in other Linux Foundation organization with the governing board at the top. There's a bunch of committees related to this. There's a TAC, it will be the kind of the talk here at Hyperledger. And then it governs a bunch of different groups and projects. Uh, there is uh, with the working groups, it, unlike Hyperledger, which is very uh, focused on producing software, uh, OpenSSF actually is, uh, <clears throat> does not produce that much software compared to the activities they have. Uh, and I'll go a little bit into the details of what these different groups func uh, focus on, but. Uh, some of them just produce documentation specifications do you know uh, they have like uh, reach out uh, activities trying to uh, educate people on the problem and so on so there are different projects within the working groups 
we've tried to define a structure, a governance structure now, where working groups basically are this kind of umbrella project. And then underneath there is actual project that focus on, on code, why, and or SIGs, you know, as that uh, produce non-code specific, I mean, that do not focus on generating code. Anyway, this can give you uh, some of the examples of the different activities that are being, uh, you know, held by these working groups. Uh, so you can see that, for instance, the best practices working group, uh, <clears throat> it works on different things, some of which are, you know, documentation, developing um, uh, courses material, actually. Uh, and, um, they are they are not actually necessarily developing tools, although scorecard is one of the tools that I think we should leverage. And I will get back to this. And some of the structure is somewhat arbitrary. In some cases, you wonder why scorecard is actually not in security tooling. And you know, it's really historical, and that's part of the work that is underway now. It's the result of that first year that I referred to before the fully funded project where things grew more organically than not. And uh, it was not very well organized. And there are probably some of these things will be rearranged as we move, uh, as we move forward. <clears throat> but so uh, I'm not going to get into any of the further details. It's just to give you a quick overview. I suppose as I'm babbling, uh, you can read <laughs> for yourself some of these things. Uh, there are tools, right? There are things like Fuzz Introspector is an interesting tool, or just to name one that I'm looking at right now. It's a tool that is developed that will help you figure out whether your Fuzz tool, Fuzzing tool, actually that has proper coverage. And it will actually trace the different, you know, path of code that it's actually uh, covering and identify code that it doesn't hit and suggest different you know configuration or examples things you can do to get more out of your uh, fuzz uh, and um, uh, there are projects that are related to identifying which are the most critical project because as open ssf started saying hey maybe we should invest in securing some of the most critical project the next question was like well which are those and so there are tools that are being developed that actually tries to just do that. There's a bunch of criteria they use. I'm talking about criticality score in case you wonder. Um, that basically forages through the internet for all the repos that you can find and try to score them and uh, identify which are the most critical ones. So that when there are projects that open a set that say, hey, we want to, you know, so for instance, I participated in an initiative where we're distributing uh, multi-factor authentication tokens and we wanted to distribute them to the top, you know, what are the projects? Like, well, which one are those? And so we went to this kind of projects that we're trying to list them and so on. So I just to give you, you know, again, an idea and I'm not even going to get into the detail of this, but you can see there's an exercise going on, which is to identify how all these different activities map to the threats, you know, that uh, I, I that I talked about earlier in this uh, build pipeline, and um, to see if we have gaps, and uh, you know, make sure that we are actually trying to, you know, we're trying to cover as many bases as possible. So this is a slide that just points out that, as I was saying earlier, it's not like this is an exclusive activity at OpenSSF. From an industry point of view, uh, other organizations are working on this problem in one way or another. For instance, I referred to as bonds earlier, there are different standardization processes in, uh, underway. SPDX is one of them. And uh, you know, it's not happening in OpenSSF even though you know one of the activities in OpenSSF to make sure that everybody can generate these bonds. And so there as OpenSSF actually has uh, connections and liaisons with many other organizations that are working on similar uh, issues. And there are things like CNCF, for instance, 
you know, uh, they have been working on securing containers for a long time. And so they have activities that are totally related to this uh, problem. And uh, there are things that are being done, like uh, for those who are familiar with Tecton, you know, which is a very popular system for CICD pipelines. And uh, there are activities to enable Tecton to support the kind of securization that we're talking about. So now I wanted to, you know, try to make it more practical for Hyperledger um, for you guys. And so these are some of the items that I think are worth specifically considering in the in this, you know, in the case of Hyperledger. So there is a guide. I actually this this is how I started bringing OpenSSF into Hyperledger last year. There was a guide produced on how to coordinate vulnerability disclosure. And um, this is really like a, a recipe, if you will, and uh, it defines what you should do. Of course, it goes into saying, you know, you should have a security ID file, which we have because we have that in our common repository structure, but it also defines how you should interact with the reporters of vulnerabilities. And it gives you very practical ways on how to handle it and try to do a good job at it and setting the right expectations and so on. And um, this is something we should really consider adopting broadly and implementing. There are a couple of guides that are actually more about trying to educate people on the problems. Of, and I mean, one of them is very general uh, uh, course material on, on developing more secure software. And you know, one question we could ask is, we could at least advertise this kind of material. I, I've actually took it, you know, I took all of the, the courses that were available. And even though I've been you know, a software engineer for a long time, there are still things that I learned by going through this, right? And so I think at least we should advertise this to our community of developers, contributors, but we could even consider maybe saying, hey, all the maintainers should have at least taken that. And you know, we could try to decide how we do this. And at least for information, there's one uh, guide specific to NPM that tells you how to you know, kind of gauge whether to trust, uh, you, know, you can trust uh, the NPM packages you're using and so on. And, and with very practical uh, information and on what to do and what not to do to try to reduce the risk of pulling in some of those uh, dependencies. Of course, there is the CIA, CIA uh, practice uh, badge. It's actually not a new thing and uh, it has been used. Uh, I don't think we have insisted too much on it. I remember I personally worked on the trying to get it for Fabric, there are different levels. It's actually a project that it wasn't part of OpenSSF, but that has now been adopted by OpenSSF. And this is something we probably should have another look at and see if we could get better at that. And, uh, and then there are some tools that I think we really ought to consider using, Scorecard and All-Star. These are systems that can be used to to actually, uh, there, uh, oh, I have some details, I'll get into this next. Scorecard, All Star, Six Store, and Salsa are the next one. I'll get a bit more detail in those. So, Scorecard, um, it runs a bunch of uh, tool uh, checks against the, uh, the, the repository, and uh, it will actually give you some scores. It actually is not a one dimension thing. It has been accepted that we are trying to give the one score is not really uh, the most interesting things. And it depends on how you weight things and so on. But it still does a bunch of tests that can be quite informative as to, you know, whether the, the how you're doing from a security point of view in the rep repository. And uh, All Star kind of works along with this and allows you to run the tool on a regular basis and make sure that you're complying with some policy that you've actually defined for your for your repository. These are the things that we could that are available today that Hyperledger could decide. Yes, we should all use this. It's a matter of putting the right GitHub actions so that when somebody pushes a commit or merge you know, we run those things. 
six store is a key part of trying to securing software artifacts. So, you know, it's fairly, it's fairly customary that people will sign packages that they, they uh, publish. I mean, I remember 25 years ago when I was working in Apache, we already did this systematically when we released the software, we make a tar file, right? And we, we would sign it. The problem is it requires dealing with uh, keys. And this is typically a problem. People don't know where to find, you know, uh, well, developers have trouble keeping track of their keys. They are often lost, the, the private keys leak and so on. So essentially six store is a set of tools that makes this much easier. The motivation uh, was to try to do a bit like what happened for SSH for the web with Let's Encrypt, where they said, you know what? We all should have, we should all use HTTPS. And so the problem is having certificates is not so easy, it costs money. And they decided to create Let's Encrypt and give you know, everybody the way to do it very easily for free. And so this is similar here, Six Door is a set of tools that will actually allow you to sign your artifacts when you publish them and uh, people can, it actually creates temporary keys. So you don't have to store them. There is, it's associated with the log that basically, you know, will store the fact that you have signed the, uh, the package at that point. And then you can get rid of the private key, if you will, because you don't need it. People can just go to the log and verify that, yes, it was signed at that point. Therefore I can trust it. And uh, quickly, I will finish with this, you know, from a more broader, from a, from a broader perspective, there is, you know, a specification that is being developed called SALSA. Um, it stands for supply chain levels for software artifacts and essentially defines a set of levels that defines different criteria and requirements to be met for build system to um, you know, produce and verify the right amount of information. The idea essentially is that as you build you know, your software artifacts, you should be gathering all the information that pertains to the build so, and produce what is called salsa provenance, uh, an attestation of what you know, what, what is the makeup of the software you're actually distributing. And um, again, this is uh, something that is not necessarily hard to do. There is actually a tool uh, which can be used uh, along with GitHub, which is what we use in the Hyperledger. And uh, with the right GitHub actions, you can have, a, you know, those systems put in place so that systematically when we make a release, we produce the kind of material that you know makes you compliant with salsa level three, which is already pretty high level. So this is basically the kind of things that I think we should really try to consider doing. And I just put on the last slide, there's a bunch of uh, pointers. If you want to want to dig any further, I'll be happy to post the slide somewhere, I don't know, maybe as an attachment to the wiki or page or something like this uh, after the fact so that everybody can have those links and actually click on that because it doesn't work over Zoom. But I hope this kind of gives you an idea of, you know, what OpenSSF is about and why I think I have been saying we really ought to do better than we do today. And uh, let's have a look a serious look and as an organization define some policy that you know we want to be seen uh, applied across the different uh, hyperledger projects yeah thank you arno i think this was a really useful overview that you've given us i think it gives a lot of interesting um ideas uh thoughts around kind of where we should be focused and some of the sorts of things that might be interesting for the security task force to bring to the TOC as kind of 
proposals and, and guidelines for how we best develop secure software within the Hyperledger Foundation. So I appreciate the the overview. I think it was extremely useful. Does anyone have any questions for Arno or any thoughts or comments about what was presented here? I will add that, you know, obviously all of this is very much work in progress. Things are changing very quickly. You know, the salsa spec that I just talked about uh, is still very much work in progress. So that means the tools, they're not necessarily completely in line with the spec. And, you know, you have to, but, you know, those things keep changing and we'll have to just adjust as we move on. But I don't think it's, it's an excuse to do nothing. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Peter? Uh, thank you for the presentation, Arno. Quick and maybe more of a specific question. Are there any specific recommended SBOM generation tools that OpenSS recommends or not yet? No, there isn't. And I mean, this is the kind of, there is actually a discussion right now as to whether OpenSSF should get into the, you know, recommending specific tools. There is a lot of activity in the industry on, you know, producing tools that people expect to make money out of, uh, you know, around all these topics. And, 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 and so this is an area where, well, you know, should OpenSSF start recommending any specific tool and maybe piece off some people? <laughs> so, yeah. No. Makes sense. I get both sides of it. Uh, because if you start recommending things, then that's always going to be a contentious issue of what's the yeah. official recommended one and why. Uh, with all that said, just from my maintainer perspective, to me, it would add value if there was a recommended tool that just actually works out of the box. Of course, I don't know how. The tool like it can be recommended because every project project is different. Uh, but if it existed, that would be great. It's just my personal submission or so whatever. Thank you. Yes, and I, I will say, I mean, they, you know, to, to again point out how things are still in flux. You know, I talked about salsa and the the, the GitHub generator. It produces salsa provenance, which when you look at it, especially in version one zero. Is kind of like an SBOM, but it doesn't use any SBOM <laughs> uh, format. And uh, they have reasons for this because the SBOMs, the way they are today, they cannot carry the, all the information that Salsa wants to carry. And so they define their own format. And it's like, well, okay, so I'm going to use Salsa to produce provenance document attestations. And then I'm going to still have to use yet another tool to produce an SBOM. What's the sense in this? And everybody recognized this is suboptimal, but it's the kind of stuff it's like, well, yeah, we'll get there eventually and clean this all up. But for now, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be a bit uh, chaotic. Makes sense. Well, fingers crossed that it gets figured out. Marcus. Marcus. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Anno, for this nice overview. I mean, this is pretty cool. And I really think that Hyperledger could basically benefit from those artifacts which are developed there in OpenSSF. Um, I mean, just uh, to, to introduce new best practices um, here for us. But when you showed the, um, the six door slide, I was also really wondering, I mean, is there also something we could basically help our community to also place um, one of our projects or tools um, in, in their projects? I mean, uh, for instance, the, the Rico component you were mentioning, which yes. basically builds a transparent block. This sounds like a blockchain, right? So yes. <laughs> And if you go to the six store, I, I agree with you. And, you know, it's funny. So Brian Bellendorf is a general manager of OpenSSF, right? Exactly. And, uh, and, and, you know, when we first met there, you know, we were laughing about the fact that it's, you know, there is so much stuff that you feel like we should really use blockchain for this. And, 
at the same time, there was a bit of hesitation to bringing it up because not everybody, you know, the term blockchain for better and for it, it's not always welcome. And so, um, in fact, there's on if you go to the six dev website, you'll find that it's like I think an FAQ, but you know, uh, is six store using a blockchain? And they specifically say no, it doesn't. And so it's centralized, but it does use uh, uh, you know a ledger uh, that is uh, that has some of the features of blockchain. It's just not decentralized, and. Uh, you know, you, I have actually said, you know, within openness, if I said, I think, you know, if there was a problem, this is one area you could say, well, you know, should we decentralize six store? And if you did, well, you would just replace Raker by a, a blockchain. But for now, I can see there's not much appetite because there is so much else to tackle. And this is not really, people are not concerned by the fact that, well, you know, six store is centralized. And in fact, I mean, yeah, so, so the, I, I should point out that uh, JFrog is a company that is a member of Hyperledger. I, I don't know if they still are, but uh, they were at least. And they have been trying to promote, uh, you know, blockchain-based solution to some of the problems being tackled in uh, in that space. Um, I would say with, you know, with some difficulty because like I said, there are people who are quite reluctant to using anything to do with blockchain. I don't think for good reasons, but. but so maybe it's our chance to, uh... Uh, to talk to the different people and I mean try to overcome those obstacles. I, I don't know. Yes, I mean, I mean is is definitely you know something that uh, that that could be done and maybe should be done to some level at least. You know, reaching out and say, okay, guys. Yeah, I mean it's all about the messaging and framing in the end of the day. I guess I mean if we go there and say, hey, please uh, replace Recore with a blockchain, maybe that's not. Uh, the message he would like to do, but I mean, saying, hey, look, uh, you could basically provide an alternative implementation of Recall blockchain based one uh, for yes. everyone who would like to deploy something like that, right? Um, and yes. I don't know if, if we can basically uh, try to mediate and to overcome those obstacles, but also pushing um, our community to basically look into that and maybe point, hey, look, there is a use case for blockchain. Uh, isn't that interesting um, for us? Uh, is someone interested in working on that? Uh, something like that. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point you make there. Uh, I think this is the kind of project that could be uh, worth uh, looking into. And I have to say, I mean, from that point of view, OpenSSF, is just like a hyperledger, and I think every uh, uh, NF uh, initiative, uh, it's completely open. Anybody is welcome to participate. It's very easy to come up and start participating in working groups. And you just look at the calendar. You say, "Hey, I'm going to show up," and you introduce yourself, and and you can start listening in, and participating, and and you can make proposals. So it's pretty easy to do that. Mm. Dave? Uh, hi, uh, could you share that slide again around the items that, the summary of the items that were more relevant to Hyperledger, like the guides and the, uh, the, yes. the tooling? Sure. So yeah. my, my question is, which of those is kind of low hanging fruit that you think we should go after first? It's just kind of like not much investment required, but we'll start benefiting right away. Uh, like are these guides things you think we should write or are they just maybe some links to existing guides? that other people have out there? Uh, this I, was, I was reading the bullets, maybe I missed, maybe you said that already, but like these concise guides, are those things that are already out there that are maybe the yes. set of things that, that- Yeah, these are actually very easy to find. They are, if you go to the main OpenSSF uh, the website, you can find them under resources on the, the top menu. And uh, there's a bunch of them that have been published and uh, really be available one click away from the homepage of OpenSSF. All right, so maybe we at least should get those links out, whether that's 
on a wiki or Discord to start with, and then maybe we we put those in GitHub somewhere. Yes, that's the kind of things I was thinking indeed. All right. Okay. And Stephen. On that low hanging fruit angle, I, I just took a quick look at Scorecard and All Star. And are, do you think those trying to deploy those as initially an opt in um, tool are, are? Do you know much about those tools, and are they recommended? Um, BC Gov, we have a similar type thing that sends notifications around when certain policies are not followed. Um, how effective do you think it is and would it and are the policies do you think the policies would be useful? So yeah, I mean this uh, this is by the way the YMMV is your mileage may vary. This is my opinionated slide, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so it's not meant to be exhaustive and and you know the AV other tools like I was saying earlier, there's a lot of you know activity in the industry around those those different topics. And so I'm not saying these are the only ones and the only possibilities, but uh, I you know I have actually worked on scorecard a little bit myself. I've contributed some bug fixes and things, but you know, so I do think it's it's a useful tool. I don't have, I have to admit, I don't know how it compares to others like the ones you might be using already. But uh, I think, you know, in keeping with what we've been doing in some other cases, it could be, a policy could be, you must use something like that. And, you know, if nothing else, at least use those. Or if you have others you prefer, it might be fine. You may not need to change and you know you may not be gaining anything by changing to those from what tools you already use and so but i think the the main point would be to say you have to have this kind of tools <laughs> at play now yeah i would think um migrating to some tool like this and then with projects that have the capacity to use it initially you know, central support to deploy it, an opt-in policy initially migrating to a required policy. Um, but I just, what I can't yes. tell from reading it is, you know, what are the specific benefits we're going to get from it versus, you know, we all get Dependabot. I assume we all have Dependabot turned on for all of our, our, our repos. So there's, I would see this as the same sort of thing. What I don't know is, you know, how much, you know, how are there actual um, policies in there that would help us in this path? Yeah. So scorecard is not just about doing the kind of like uh, scanning of your code and trying to figure out vulnerabilities and so on. It's more about the overall project. So, for instance, you will look at, you know, uh, so it helps identify also for dependencies, right? Evaluate dependencies uh, so that, um, for instance, you will look at the policies for merging a pull request, where there, uh, you know, it requires review by uh, the, you know, somebody else than the author of the commit of the pull request. And, you know, there are tests like this that are completely different and that are still, uh, that still have an impact that are meaningful in terms of the security of the software. Um, but so I think we need to, We it's kind of two ways using those tools. It helps you to uh, you know, evaluate dependencies you have, but equally, you know, by producing, uh, implementing those, it also helps, you know, inform others that are depending on our tools. And so it's more like about, you know, also helping out. You know, one of the issues in, Going back to salsa, one thing that has been discussed in salsa, for instance, is there's this notion of level. Is that recursive? Does that involve dependencies? And the answer might surprise you, but for now, the answer is no, it's not recursive. It's just an attestation of what you actually, you know, directly may, uh, uh, manage. And the reason is, you know, it would be impossible to reach any higher level than zero 
you, you know, if you had to secure all the dependencies you have underneath. So to, for practical reason, to be able to start somewhere, you know, we had to decide, well, we have to, it, it won't be recursive and you, you can only make an attestation about the level you are at in the supply chain. And so this is all being part of, you have to start somewhere. And the more people, as we progress, the more projects, you know, start adopting those tools, the better we will be eventually. All right. Thanks again, Arno, for the presentation. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left in our call today. I do want to see if we can touch on the first item in our discussion topics around uh, moving the project reports to GitHub. Um, I did see that Rai had a chance to put in specifics about the why and the process and, and that sort of thing. So um, if we could take a look at that, we will um, hold off on kind of the task force discussions until next week. Uh, so happy to share my screen if we don't have somebody else sharing. Uh I'm I, I'm back. Okay, I just would like to bring up the the proposal uh, for the move project reports to GitHub. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, right. You added the the why in the proposed process. Uh, did anybody have an opportunity to review this? Any comments that anybody has? Uh, any thoughts on kind of what we would do in order to to move the project reports over to GitHub. I think the, the first question I have is, do we leave the existing project reports where they're at, or do we try to migrate those over uh, at some point? My plan was to uh, migrate them, basically do some sort of an uh, HTML to markdown transcription so that the comments were still there um and then going forward uh do do the thing okay anybody have any objections to this proposal any concerns that anybody has with doing this I, I, Mr. Dave, I was a little bit concerned it would be more difficult to collaborate with somebody else when creating a report. Like sometimes there's two people uh, that work together on a report and it's very easy on the wiki. It'd be a little bit more difficult on GitHub, but I think these the rationale here overrides those concerns. So I'm good with it. Also, I have a small comment. So it's going to be Markdown, right? Yeah. So if somebody wants to collaborate, they could use something like HackMD and uh, essentially do it uh, in collaborative tool, but then commit everything. And it's not split by commits, but it's something as well, if the collaboration is important for some time. And another thing that you, you could do um, would be to, uh, you know, create a draft PR and I think it's pretty easy when you create a draft PR to add collaborators. Uh, my overall plan was that basically uh, there would be a bug, an issue, sorry, created every quarter, and it would be assigned to the maintainers group, like, at, you know, whatever, at Hyperledger slash Fabric dash maintainers. Um, and then a PR could be created from the template and it would have, uh, you know, the people who are in that group can feel free to edit that PR. I understand that editing a PR is chunkier than editing in the wiki, but uh, I'm, I'm open to feedback. Peter? 
wanted to say thumbs up. I think it's a good idea. All right. Thanks, Peter. Agree with Happy. Bobby, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm just, my only concern with this is for people who aren't developers who are interested in looking at what's going on, the wiki page is so easy for them to just read. Um, and that might leave some information that doesn't get transmitted to people where it needs to get because it's in a GitHub repository and not on a readable wiki page. So I, I, I agree. Um, for uh, for for instance, the these proposals for labs, once they're accepted, they get rendered on this web page. Um, and it would be something similar, where if you go to uh, let me see. If you go to the TOC website, uh, you'll see that you know edits edits here come in through a, a PR for like the TOC members. Um, you know this comes from a, a PR that's submitted over here. Uh, so I I agree. One thing that uh, could be done is much like this page uh you can include uh markdown by reference so you could have a page here that uh consumes another page and shows uh the updates so i i don't remember if it's still the case but it used to be that like for instance this trending community activity that's consumed from a web page, or I'm sorry, that's consumed from a GitHub uh, markdown, blah, blah, blah. This list used to be consumed of, of projects. It isn't any longer because it was too hard to get the formatting to work. Uh, so there are ways to programmatically consume this stuff. And I would, I'll commit to setting something up like that, where not only would we have a, you know, a website like this, that would be rendered, uh, but that there would there, there would essentially be a feed from here. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, but if we do have that website, um, the other one that you were on, Ryan. Yeah, if we have something like this, I think this is sufficient. I don't think we need it in two places. I think one one of the reasons why we want to move away from the wiki is to get stuff off the wiki, right? So we don't have to maintain it there. And so having a single source like this one, as long as it's in a easily consumable format, I think that's fine. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? Do we think we're ready to vote on this? Uh, one more question. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. I'll put my uh, hand uh, up. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering. Uh, the wiki people can comment, right? Is that uh, that's not going to be possible on a GitHub page or a PR? You'll have to have a GitHub account, but yes. Okay. Is that going to be intuitive to people? Well, that I don't know. Okay. Yeah, realistically, the, the only people that have ever commented are people that are GitHub users, either, you know, either a TOC member or a maintainer, typically. I know that's not 100% of the time, but historically, that's been true at least. Okay, cool. So I don't have a major objection. Even was your question answered? I, I guess I was just going to ask, do, do we have any doubt that whoever is doing all these reports would have any problem with this that's the only thing i can think of is are, are the people that are producing the reports today going to have a problem with this once they hear about it or should we let people know 
that are producing these reports that, hey, the next one's going to be in GitHub. Any problems with that? Or is that just not a problem? It's it's a good question. I do know in the past there have been uh, non-maintainers, right? Sort of like project managers that have done these reports uh, for different projects. But I believe each of those people still had GitHub accounts. Um, but yeah, it might be it might be worthwhile to maybe send to the maintainers chat channel just a message uh, asking them if anybody has any objections or just bringing this to their attention that this is something that we're looking to vote on uh, and we can do that vote next week. That sounds reasonable to me. Okay, uh, Arun? Right, um, sorry, one more, one more question. I don't know if it makes sense at this point in time, but though when we start, uh, accumulating all these reports. I know some of the times um, since I worked on something similar, having multiple markdown files in one single repository tends to bloat up and then the like it, it becomes unmanageable sometimes to even raise a PR or work on adding a new report. And I know that may, maybe we'll not see it immediately. We may see it in future. So something to be wary of. So I, I agree, and that is actually a pain point that I have in the wiki as well. Uh, my plan is that each uh, year or quarter or something, there would be a, a folder where, you know, it would be like 2023 slash Q1 slash whatever. Um, and then it would be the at the at the top level, it would be rendered as, you know, you'd have the folders on the left that would collapse. I don't have a good example of that right now. None of these collapse, um, but that that was my idea. Um, so actually, this one collapsed. So for labs like this, you know, you would see this, and then you would see 2023, and then you know Q1 or whatever. However, we wanted to dice it up. That was my plan. I think that makes sense. All right, um, so we are at time. I will post something on the maintainers channel about this. We will revisit it next week. We will also visit the task forces task forces that we want to create um, for this year that we can uh, work through. So thanks all for attending. Again, thank you, Arno, for the, the wonderful presentation. I think it was very useful. Uh, and was uh, happy to spend the extra time on it. So we will see you again next week.